right. Welcome back to another Kirby on Sports podcast exclusive, exclusively on the Kirby on Sports podcast YouTube page. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks to our sponsors, as always, PM Plus Reserves, Shenandoah Primitives, Dr. Dave Leadership Corporation, and Mark Francis with Icon Real Estate. Without our sponsors, the Kirby on Sports podcast would not be where it is today. Today, we are joined by the voice of the Washington Wizards and um, Atlanta Falcons in the preseason, and he does so much more. My guy, Justin Kutcher. Find him on Twitter at Justin Kutcher. Justin, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for um, taking the time to be with us today. Uh, obviously, it's in the off season for you. You just got done calling preseason games for the Falcons. So how's your off season? How is everything going so far? Honestly, the off season has been um, really pretty special. I got a lot of time to spend with my family. Uh, I've got eight nieces and nephews. So oh. there are 17 of us. And uh, for the first time in three years, we all got together not once, but twice. And, and so that was really neat. Uh, my, my 10 year old nephew had a hole in one while playing with my brother and my mom. Um, so three generations to see that happen. Uh, it's, it's just been a lot of cool things. And, and I've got a chance to see friends down in Charlotte, see friends here in DC, got to win a golf tournament. Um, so honestly, uh, it, it's funny. I, I, I was never a big believer in things happen for a reason, but as I get older, I, I kind of feel like things do happen for a reason. And, and this off season, I never really get an off season. And this off season has allowed me to spend that time with, with loved ones. And it's been really special. That, that is very great to hear. I'm uh, happy for you in that. Um, so can, can I start off by saying, I think, I, I know you do the wizards, you do the Falcons in pre uh, preseason, but I think you're really well known for, in my opinion, Justin, the fact that you called a week 17 game, the Packers and the Lions with Pat McAfee. I mm -hmm. mean, so straight up, I remember that call crystal clear and I just have to bring it up. Pat McAfee being the special teams guy that he is, especially when Matt Prater threw that touchdown. That was probably really electric being a being in a broadcast booth with Pat McAfee. It was great. I, I, Pat, Pat's a character. And, and it, honestly, what you see on the air is really him. And I, I, after the game, I think, I think the final score is like 30 to nothing. And I said, Pat, those are the games that we get paid for. Like the close games, those are easy to call. The blowout games to keep it interesting, that's tough. And we just made a 30 to nothing game be fun. And when that, when that touchdown was thrown, Pat like couldn't contain himself. And it was, it was awesome. Um, and Pat, you know, there, I've worked with a few analysts who can kind of see things. And we walked into Packers practice and right away he saw something with their kicking game. And he was like, ooh. Ooh. And he actually went and spoke with the, with the kicking team and uh, he identified it right away, what the problem was. And I was like, wow, that was, that was impressive. So Pat, Pat has obviously done some amazing things now in his career as a broadcaster. He's a really intelligent guy and he's fun to work with. I can't lie. I mean, he, a lot of people get nervous for the opens on camera there was no nerves at all whatsoever for Pat. Yeah, uh, I, I think it was really great going back to that Prater field goal, uh, fake field goal he threw to Toy Lolo for that touchdown. It, it seemed like Pat was like, oh, out of the way, Justin, I'll call this one because he, oh. he just straight up was like touchdown before. It, it was the greatest call I've ever heard Pat McAfee do. <laughs> well, to be honest with you, like, that I think a lot of play-by-play -play guys might be upset because you know it could say like you're stepping on your toes I loved it because I you could see like Pat could see it happening before it happens and I mean when he's going oh 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 um you know and and that kind of alerts me so that that part of it was great and and I always say you want 
your analyst to have the emotion. You want your analyst to be so involved in the game. And that's why I think people love Tony Romo and why he makes the money he makes, because it's not just that he's teaching you during the broadcast, you know, what they're doing, but he's, he's loving it. Like he's a fan and that's what Pat was doing. So I think Pat, I think Pat's really talented. Um, and I, and I, I love to see the success that he's having. Yeah. It, it's really great too. He ho hosts his own show and that studio by far is amazing. And Aaron Rodgers every single week, that is, it's always great to see, but. So guess what? That all started that week. No really? joke. We, we had Aaron Rodgers walk into our production meeting and he's like, dude, I'm a huge fan. And <laughs> like that happened right there. And then now, and then, um, I worked with AJ Hawk too in the past. And so AJ and Aaron are really tight. And so with AJ and, and Pat doing the show and getting Aaron, I think it's really neat because I, I, to me that my two favorite athletes to interview are Aaron Rodgers and Bradley Beal. And I say that because they are both so smart and they don't give you token answers. They actually listen to what you're asking and they think about what they want to say, and they gave a really well thought out answer, and they're honest. And and so, but that all, I, I believe it all started that day, that production meeting. That is incredible. A absolutely incredible right there. Um, it, but going back to what you said about those two athletes you enjoy interviewing, that must make your job a lot easier, but in all the different aspects. We'll, we'll get into more about the Wizards later, but that that must make your job a lot easier when they're giving you well thought answers to tie into your broadcasts and stuff like that too. It does no doubt about it. And, and it also, I mean, I can remember a game last year with Brad uh, after the game, we do a post game interview with him, and the answer he gave, it just, just wasn't a typical answer. And I said, Hey, Brad, um, I just want to say thank you for always being so candid and honest with us. And he's like, yeah, of course. And, and I'm like, no, most people aren't like that, but you always give these really well thought out, honest answers. And I just respect him for doing it. And the same thing with Aaron, um, he gives honest answers, well thought out, and you could have fun with them, you know? And, and that to me, like one day, my first ever time covering Rogers, I said, you know, so who's the better actor, you or Clay Matthews? <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he starts laughing about that and that, that's the icebreaker. And it's just fun to be able to do that. So Justin, where did you get your start? Was it football or basketball? Can you sort of tell us about how you got started covering sports, how it all began for you? Uh, broadcasting wise, my first game I ever called was a basketball game. And it was my freshman year in college. I was going to engineer the game in studio the analyst didn't show up. So the sports director said, Hey, um, go jump on the train. You've got to be the analyst for this game. And I had thought about walking on to play basketball at BU. And so I go up and it happened to be Hofstra against BU. Speedy Claxton was the point guard for Hofstra. Jay Wright was the head coach. Mm -hmm. And it just, it felt like I was playing all over again. Um, it felt like I was the point guard on the floor I could see what defenses they were throwing at BU and where everybody had to be. And once that happened, I was like, well, this is it. I got to, I got to be a play-by-play -play guy because I miss playing so much that it gave me that, that, that fix, that fill that I needed in my life. And once that happened, I said, all right, you know what? We are going all in on this. And uh, that's, that's basically how it started was, was doing that basketball. And then I did some basketball play by play and in college, uh, did soccer play by play hockey, play by play, oh. um, some softball play by play and, and just tried to expand as much as we could with the sports station. So what is your, do you prefer one sport you'd rather call over the others? Uh, something like that. I usually ask everybody this, but uh, that and what are some of the differences between calling like basketball and football, for example? So I always say baseball and basketball are my two favorites. 
Um, I played so much of them growing up. I've watched so much of them. Uh, I feel really comfortable with them. Football is a really, it's, it's the biggest production of any of the sports. You know, I've got my spotter, I've got my stats guy. Without those two guys, I'd be lost. And without my analyst telling me what the defense is running, I'd have no idea. So, so there's, there's that element of it. Um, but it's funny, like doing hockey, hockey and soccer, as weird as it sounds, have a lot of similarities. The way the, the ball in soccer moves around the field, it's kind of like the puck on the rink. Um, but the difference is the puck moves a lot faster than the ball does in soccer. And, but when you say like in soccer, it's shot goal and hockey, it's shot scores. Um, and so th there are those things, but, uh, you know, just, just, I've been lucky enough to call a crazy variety of sports, including shooting at the Olympics and judo, um, um that, and the Westminster dog show, um, I think that the main job of the play-by-play -play guy is, is to sense the moment and to be able to punctuate that moment and, and make your, your analyst be the star. Absolutely. That that's a really great answer there. So um, before we get into the wizards, I would like to touch briefly since we are in football season, you covered the Atlanta Falcons um, preseason uh, three games in the preseason, not, no, not a fourth. They limited it to three this year, added the extra week at the end of the season, as we all know, but uh, tell us a little bit about what you saw from the Falcons. I know it is pre it was preseason, but uh, I know this struggling Falcons team needs something and I, I, I can't really say for sure what it is, but that draft pick of Kyle Pitts, I think that was really good. What did you see out of the Falcons in preseason? What did you like? What do you think they need to improve on? So it's tough because the preseason, we didn't get to see any of the real starters. Yeah. Um, there was no Matt Ryan. There was no Kyle Pitts, you know, no Calvin really? Ridley. Yeah, they didn't play at all. Pitts, I thought Pitts played in one of those games. I must so, have been mistaken. We did the we did the first two games. The last game against Cleveland, we didn't do. And um, so I, I would I would have loved to have seen Pitts on the field uh, because I actually the descriptions that Steve Weich was giving that that DJ Shockley was giving it almost reminded me of of like Calvin Johnson, but as a tight end. And, and so that I think is really intriguing um, for, for the Falcons, what they need. And Arthur Smith is doing this where he's trying to instill it is the discipline. They can't allow for the penalties to kill themselves. And uh, the, the, those, the false starts, the offsides, that kind of stuff can't happen. Um, you know, sometimes you make a penalty on defense because you're overly aggressive. Coaches are okay with that, but the, the, the mental mistakes can't happen. So they need that. I think Matt Ryan still has a lot left in his, in his game. I think we're seeing it. Obviously Tom Brady is, is of another planet. Uh, but you know, what Drew Brees was able to do, what Peyton Manning was able to do play late in his career, even after the fusion in his neck, you're seeing quarterbacks, Aaron Rodgers. I think because of the rule changes and the way guys take care of their bodies, they can play later and later into their career and have great success. So I know people were maybe upset they did not take Justin Fields. I th personally think they made the right choice by going with Pitts and not Fields. I think you can get still a lot of, of value out of, out of uh, Matt Ryan. And then they need the run game. They haven't had a run game in a long time. Um, so you need to be able to, to pound the ball, to punish the defense, and tire the defense out. But if you fall behind early, as they've been doing, that takes the running option out of it and you're putting everything on Matt Ryan's arm again, and you're not doing what Arthur Smith ultimately wants to do. So uh, the post, the, the preseason for, for the Falcons, I don't think went the way that they would have hoped. Um, but I do have faith in, in Arthur Smith. I like Terry Fontenot as the GM and, and I love Arthur Blank as the owner. I think he's one of the best owners in sports. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's really great too. And um, uh, I, I would imagine you call one of their preseason games at home. That stadium mm -hmm. there is just incredible. It is. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, 
when they were building it, I'm like, what the heck is this? <laughs> and then I called the first football game there. And I'm like, this place is sick. And it really is. Uh, it's, it's a great environment for the fans. The fact that they keep the concession prices cheap, affordable, great options. Um, it's, it's a multi-use facility. They, they nailed it. I can't honestly say that many stadiums had nailed it. Arthur Blank and the Falcons nailed it with that place. Yes. Yeah, speaking of concessions, when they first opened that stadium, as you said, it's a multi-use stadium. I'm, I heard that they put a Chick-fil-A in it in NFL plays on Sundays and it's closed. So I was like, what is the point of putting a Chick-fil-A in a football stadium if it's not going to be open? But like you said, it's a multi-use stadium, I right. assume, for concerts and stuff. But I thought that was hilarious just reading that they put a Chick-fil-A in. Well, think about this. Think about this. In, in, in a football season, you're going to have eight home games, right? Mm -hmm. They have the Atlanta United, the soccer team plays there. They have national championships there in football. They have the SEC championship there. They have all those concerts. So let's say in a year, they maybe have 250 or 300 events. So it's closed eight days out of that. What they do with Chick-fil-A on those other days, on those 240 other days, they crush it. Yeah, they probably do. And I, didn't, I did not think about the fact when I was reading that article that United plays there and there are concerts and stuff. So it was funny to me, but still, I mean, l like you said, the concession prices there are so low. Even Capital One Arena, FedEx Field, you name it, like the concession prices are for, through the roof. Like bottomless popcorn and Cap One, $9. Souvenir soda for 10 but at least it's refillable. But I mean, it, it's crazy that they can do that, but it's great because you're probably making more money by lowering the prices because the fans are going to keep coming back for more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, I can't, I can't speak to much of it. All I know is the food is good Yeah, and uh, they keep on bringing me food during preseason games and I'm very wow. appreciative. Oh, wow. That's great. So um, let's move right along. Let's talk about the Washington Wizards, your main gig for the most part of the NBA season. You call the games on NBC Sports Washington with Drew Gooden. First and foremost, I know um, this pandemic, it's still raging and uh, basketball has been affected by this pandemic. And I know there have been a lot of changes. Justin, I ask everybody this. I will ask you the same thing. How was it as a broadcaster to call away games off a TV screen? Because I know most broadcasters had to make some sort of adjustments during this pandemic. And I think for the most part, the stations, the radio stations, for the most part, did a very good job adapting to changes during this COVID-19 pandemic. So what were some of the challenges for you and your broadcast crew while calling these games off a monitor and not in person? Um, look, we'd always rather be in person, right? Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we were also very happy to be calling games last year and to have a season. And, and the fact that we got through the season, uh, I commend everybody, especially the players and the coaches, because they had to go through testing each and every day. And that's not easy. And then playing in front of empty arenas, not easy. And they did it. And so kudos to them. Um, as far as broadcasting was concerned, we, I always asked if I could have, like in football, they call it the all 22 camera. I asked for a monitor with the all 10 cameras so I could see the entire court. This way, because when I do a game and I'm at the arena or the stadium, my eyes are always scanning. I'm not just looking at where the ball is, I'm looking at other places. So oftentimes the director will follow what me and Drew are saying. Well, if you're calling a game off a monitor, all of a sudden you have to follow what the director is doing. So for me, in basketball, when someone makes a play, whether they make a shot or a dunk, 
It's called the hero shot. And you follow that player down the court. Well, basketball is played at such a fast tempo, especially the Wizards, that off a, off a make, they may push it up the floor. And if you're still on the hero shot, you have no idea what happened. So I have to use that all 10 camera to see what's going on the other way so I can call the game as if I'm at the arena. Um, so that was the biggest adjustment. Uh, that and trying to, trying to create that same emotion that you would get being there. And it's not always easy. Uh, and, and I guess the last thing I would say is um, the West Coast games. You know, those games start at 10 o'clock Eastern time. You have to reprogram your body during that time. So I always, I would backtrack it. Like I would wake up in the morning, I'd do my work, but then I would take my naps and I'd make sure I worked out. If, if, if the game was at 10, we have to be at the studio at eight, I would work out at six to try to get my body going and I would eat dinner at eight. And so you kind of try to retrain your body during that time. Um, again, though, I, I, I applaud what, what the folks at NBC Sports Washington did to try to make it as smooth as possible. Uh, you know, it's obviously we'd all love to be on the road and we'd, we'd love for every, everything to go back to the way it was or, or close to it. Um, and I think we're getting closer and closer to that. But for the most part, I think we did, you know, a pretty good job. And, and, I, and I hope I hope the fans enjoy it. You were there for the most part when Russell Westbrook went off for the Wizards. It was a very, very incredible season. They ended up making it to the playoffs through the play-in tournament due to COVID. They set that up, and they lost to the 76ers in turn in the first round. I, I think the Wizards, Justin, um, are rebuilding and trying to get better and better and better, starting with the hiring of Wes Unseld. And then you trade Russell Westbrook. I was sort of confused on one, why they did that until I found out Westbrook got traded to the Lakers and we got essentially a boatload back. The Wizards did um, that trade. I, I know they got a lot of players there, but in turn, I mean, I feel like the Wizards are very much rebuilding and with his new head coach and Wes Unsell Jr., you know, the Unsell family's legacy. What can you tell us about the Wizards of this offseason and how do you think that's going to translate into next year and how they will do? Uh, honestly, I think the trade was brilliant. I think the Wizards are a better team today than they were before the trade. And I think everyone gets so caught up in superstars. I said it before, I feel so fortunate to have had the opportunity to call a full season of Russell Westbrook, to see him average a triple double, to see him break what everyone thought was an unbreakable record by the big O, Oscar Robertson. Um, that will be a highlight of my career, no doubt, for the rest of my life. Um, but to take Russell Westbrook's contract and to trade him to L.A. and turn it into Montrez Harrell, Kyle Kuzma, Contavious Caldwell-Pope, a draft pick that you then flip to get Holiday, then you get another draft pick out of that. So you got five players for one. And, there are, and really, I would say that's four rotational players. All of a sudden, you became a much deeper team. So you don't have two superstars like you had in Beal and Westbrook, but what you do have is a much deeper, better team. And then you get Spencer Dinwiddie to be in the backcourt. So now you got length in that backcourt as a point guard. I know Dinwiddie's not a great shooter, but you go out and you draft Corey Kispert. Um, so he's a great shooter. And you re-sign Howell Neto. I love Neto. I, I, I don't know if the Wizards are done making moves. I, I don't. Um, I think, I think they could still make some more moves before the season begins. But I think what Tommy Shepard has been able to do is flat out remarkable. He took John Wall's contract, which everyone thought was untradeable, and traded it for what, Russell Westbrook. And you get Russ to come here and change the attitude of this team. And what you hope is that his work ethic rubs off on the young guys on Rui, on Denny, on Daniel Gafford, on Thomas Bryant, on those type of players, even on Bradley Beal. You know, Brad saw something different. And then you that 
grows and now you take Westbrook and you turn them into all these pieces. It's to me, the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts. And I honestly believe, and I'm not saying this because I call their games. I think it was a no brainer trade. And I think the, the wizards aren't in the rebuild mode. I think the wizards are in playoff mode. Um, I think if you look at it right now, again, I, this is just me thinking, I think Kyle Kuzma has a chance. Again, I don't know if he's staying or if any, who's staying or what, but I think Kyle Kuzma has a real chance to be like a Jordan Clarkson in Utah, where he could be a sixth man of the year, where he could be that offense on that second unit. I think right now, if I were in my own mind, just figuring this out, I think you're, you're going to go with Dinwiddie and Beal in the backcourt. You're going to have Contavious Caldwell Pope as your three, Rui at the four, and Gaffer at the five. And then on your second unit, you're going to have either Neto or Holiday at the point guard. And now you've got, you know, Kuzma, Kispert, Bertans, Harrell, um, Denny Avdia. I think Denny's got a chance to be almost a point forward on that second unit. And that means you're going 10, 11 deep. And, and I just, I don't know. I think it's a legit 10, 11 deep. So I'm very curious to see what, what coach Unseld is able to do uh, offensively, how, what the plans he has for this team, but, but I'm excited. I know people might doubt trading Russell Westbrook, but I, I think I'm incredibly grateful for what he did, but I think it's, it's the absolute right move. Yeah, I, I think so too. After what you just said, after all the picks, the wizards got in return, Looking on it now, Justin, I heard this on Grant Danny on 106.7 The Fan that the Rockets are going to be sitting John Wall until they can find a place to trade him. I'm not sure if that's 100% true, but if that is, the Wizards definitely won that Westbrook versus Wall trade in my opinion. Oh, they already won it. They already yeah. won it. I mean, it's, it's, they, 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 they won it the day they made it. Um, and, and it's no offense to John, but they, they won it. And, um, Yes. They, I, I don't know what's going to happen with John Wall. I don't know where he's going to end up. Um, I, I do believe he will leave Houston, but it's going to be very interesting because he's got a lot of money left on his deal for two more years. And unless he takes a buyout, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to see where he fits. Um, I mean, I wish him the best. John treated me great. Yeah. John, and, John was great in DC. Yeah. And I can't wait to actually be able to see him in person and say, what's up, give him a hug and, and, you know, do all that. But, um, but no, the wizards, no doubt won that deal. Uh, I'll tell you what, Justin, looking uh, more on the West coast, it looks like the Lakers are going to be a force to be reckoned with. They're picking up left and right, these big names. And it looks like they're putting together a squad that pretty much Nobody can stop, in my opinion, looking at these big names they're drafting. Excuse me, not drafting, but picking up through free agency and trading. What are your thoughts on what the Lakers have been doing? Um, I actually think the opposite. I don't think anything they're doing makes sense. And I think if it were 2011, you'd say they're unstoppable. But it's 2021, 22, and I don't get it. Um, I just think that they, you know, in, in 2004, the Lakers went out and they signed Gary Payton and Carl Malone to team with Kobe and Shaq, and they made the NBA finals. And that was the year that Kobe was going through the whole rape trial and they lost the Pistons in the, in the championship. I, I just don't see this team working. Um, that that's just my personal opinion. Um, I, I, I love Russ and I wish him success in LA. I think he may put up numbers, but who's going to, who's going to dominate the ball? Like, is it going to be Russ? Is it going to be LeBron? Is LeBron going to play the four and you move Anthony Davis to the five? Where does Carmelo come in from Rondo? Like, I just think there's a whole lot of stuff going on that, that um, the names, again, it's people fall in love with the names, yeah. but you got to figure out, what you're doing and it's it's almost like 
you know, in baseball a few years ago when the Yankees went out and get, they get Randy Johnson. You're like, Oh my God, the Yankees are going to win it all. Well, Randy Johnson was like 41 years old. Like he's not, he's not Randy Johnson. He's not the right fit in that market. And, and I just kind of see that happening with the Lakers. I, I see other teams being able to take down the Lakers out West. Do you think the Bucs have another chance to repeat? They just looked strong all season. You had Giannis there. That was a really great finals matchup, by the way. Oh, it was an awesome finals matchup. And I thought that was the greatest thing that could happen for the NBA was that you had this matchup of the rising star or the rising superstar in Giannis going up against a team in Phoenix, which has a rising star in Devin Booker, Chris Paul, who made it to his first final. But to show that you don't need LeBron in the finals to have a great finals. And I think the NBA needs that. I think that, you know, the NBA right now has a lot of incredibly talented people. And, and I think, you know, having what we saw is awesome. So can Milwaukee go back to back? They can. Do I think they will? I don't. And I just think it's so hard to go back to back in any sport that I, I just don't see it happening. Um, That's just my initial gut. We're still away from the season beginning. We're still away from all the moves being made. But my initial gut is I don't think they're going to go back to back. Absolutely. Great insight. Once again, from Justin Kutcher, you can find him on Twitter at Justin Kutcher. Justin, it's been a blast chopping up with you here on the podcast. I really, I greatly appreciate the time, my friend. No problem. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. For our sponsors, PM Plus Reserves, Regroup Building Services, Shenandoah Primitives, Icon Real Estate, and Mark Francis. This has been a production of the Kirby on Sports podcast, exclusively on the Kirby on Sports podcast YouTube page. Until the next time you hear us, always remember to create greatness. So long and peace out.